Welcome to My Script Works. Now what? Hope you're enjoying yourself at the JNUC 2020 virtual conference. My name is Nick Koval, and I'm a senior professional services engineer with JAMP. This is my third JNUC presentation, but not my best picture. So let's fix that. In this presentation, I'm going to try and distill the entirety of my four years of college education in computer science and engineering down to 22 slides. I've had the privilege of working with some really talented people, some of whom have actually had a computer science degree and others that have not. In one case, one of my fellow co-workers was a music theory major. Another one had a degree in biology and yet another in geology. My hope is for those of you that didn't start off in coding and scripting to learn some of the things that were taught to those of us who did. Many of my teachers wrote programs on punch cards and had to be very concerned with items that we take for granted, like speed and disk space. So let's get started. We're going to talk about things that happen after scripts have been made. Make no mistake, this is kind of a junk drawer of scripting, so to speak. We're going to talk about where we can find scripts. Can we do things that are better with our tools than we were doing before? Are the scripts we make portable? How do we handle errors? And why is speed such a concern? So first off, where can we find scripts? Well, we have the ability to use scripts in a lot of places in Jamf Pro. In policies, we can see those scripts inside of the files and processes payload as a one-liner. We can find them in an actual script payload that's using a script that's in our Jamf Pro database. And we can sometimes see them as pre or post install scripts that are included in packages. We can also find scripts inside of settings, computer management, extension attributes, and we can include API calls in a lot of those scripts, excuse me. Those API calls that we make are one of the places where we can actually affect mobile devices or target mobile devices with our scripts. Jamf Pro actually has two APIs. The first is the classic API, which has been around for a while. You'll see it mentioned in JNUC videos that go all the way back to 2013 on the Jamf YouTube channel. It's what we currently teach inside of our Jamf certification courses, and the documentation for it can be accessed through our Jamf Pro URL slash classic API slash doc. We also have the Jamf API, what's also known as the Universal API. It's in beta right now, at least as of 10.23, but that shouldn't stop you from using it, or at least getting used to it. The documentation for it can be accessed through the URL, your Jamf Pro URL, slash API slash doc. You can read more about both of these at developer.jamf.com. So let's talk about an example. We can use the API to send remote commands to mobile devices. Many of us, Jamf included, have iOS devices that act as sign-in stations in our lobbies. It's occasionally a good idea to restart these sign-in stations but our front office staff may not be able to. Many kiosk stations are locked into single app mode, which disables some of the buttons, or they may be locked completely and physically inside of a case that prevents us from accessing the buttons at all. We can, however, perform a restart by an API command, which means that we could make that command available to our front office staff in self-service. One of the many mobile device commands that's in this list is this restart device. Notice it does have to be a supervised device for us to do this. Here's the curl command we can run in terminal to restart one or more of our devices. Keep in mind that the variables at the end, that ID list, is either a single device ID or it is a comma separated list of device IDs. It cannot be a group. ID. Let's focus a little bit more on the third line of this command. You'll notice that I've used the header authorization basic auth string here. Some of you may be more familiar with the user flag that's shown on the right. The drawback to the user flag is that it sends your username and password for your API as plain text, which isn't good. 
The header flag on the left passes your API st authorization string as a base64 coded string, which means the username and password are both encoded together. You can find more about this on developer.jamf.com by clicking on the APIs, and then under the classic API, look for code samples at the bottom. This is the code at the top of the page which tells you how to generate that base64 encoded auth string. Further down the page are examples for how to use that in both curl and Python. Shifting gears a little bit to talk about tools. During World War II, my grandfather worked in the engine room on the USS Independence. The USS Independence started its life off as the Cleveland-class light carrier, the USS Amsterdam. And it was converted, along with eight other light cruisers, into light aircraft carriers that were used in the Pacific Theater. Conversion here is a fancy word for cutting off everything above a certain level, welding on an airplane hangar and a flight deck. The only story that he shared with me about his time in the theater was that the floor was so warm he immediately rolled out and put on his boots because you couldn't stand on the floor in bare feet. After the war, he put his machining skills to use at a company called the Columbus Auto Parts, making tools and dies for the manufacturing of Ford automobiles. So a tool is used to build, form, or shape objects. Dies are tools with a very specific use. A die could be used to cut threads into a pipe or to bend a metal into a certain shape. If the tool that we're talking about is a drill, the drill bit is the die. When it comes to scripting, we have tools, which are our commands, and dies, which are our options, verbs, and flags. Those commands can change over time, and it's important to go back and look at what commands we've used within the script to see if they've changed in the newer version of Mac OS, or because we've updated our JF Pro, or because of whatever application we may have also installed on our computer. Hmm. Um, knowing what commands your script uses is extremely important. You also need to know if there were changes to the command. Did it move? Is it still available? Has the command been deprecated? Did it add new verbs? Is it backwards compatible? Once you know that information, then we have to take a look at are we using those commands effectively and efficiently? So I once wrote an extension attribute that used network setup. And that extension attribute worked great on all of our 10.9 computers. But anything that was running Mac OS 10.6 started to submit a record into our users labeled as no name. By the time we figured out what the problem was, that it was an issue with this network setup extension attribute, we had added over a thousand no name user records into our Jamf Pro. So let's take a look at one of our tools to see if we can be a little bit more effective with it. A few weeks ago, a friend of mine said he was having some issues parsing a file from Communicate Pro so that he could import it into Google. Let's use some of our command line tools to parse out this file. First, let's get a line of the file to confirm we're actually dealing with Communicate Pro. To do that, we'll use more to read the file and then pass or pipe the output to grep to filter the file for the line we're looking for. But we really don't want the entire line. The part that we really care about is the portion that's after the colon. If we pipe this to awk and use the colon as a field separator, we can only print the second field, which is what we're looking for. But I've now used three tools to get this one piece of data. If I was parsing a larger file, it can be expensive in time and system resources to use that many tools. And thankfully, Awk can actually do some of the filtering for us. So we can get rid of grep, and I can place the filter inside of slashes in awk. 
Now that we have the basics, let's get what we really came here for. Names and email addresses. Field separators in awk can be more than one character in length. So we can use cn equals as our field separator and member as our filter. Using that, we have our names and our email addresses. Awk can use multiple field separators. So in this case, I can use both cn equals and colons. We just have to separate them using a pipe. But there's one more thing that you should probably be aware of. Awk can read the file for us, which means we don't need to use more. And that allows us to get rid of another tool. At the same time, we can also change the order in which we print our results, putting the third field first, separating it by a comma, and then printing the second fields. So now we get our email addresses, followed by a comma, followed by our names. Now, let's talk a little bit about portability. One of the problems that we sometimes face is that individuals, customers, only have one Jamf Pro server, which means that server is the production server. Well, I personally acknowledge each of you that only have one server um, as very hardcore Jamf Pro administrators. Only having one server can eventually lead to some problems we would really like you to have more than one Jamf Pro server. Please reach out to your customer success manager about how to obtain a dev or a test Jamf Pro server. Also, feel free to log into your Jamf Nation portal and on there, join the beta. Now, we've got three Jamf Pro servers in place, but that means that we have to make items consistent between those servers. So I want to point out two tools by one of my coworkers, Leslie Hulu. The first is the Jamf Cloud Package Replicator, which can be used to move packages from one Jamf Pro server to another. Another great tool, the Jamf Migrator tool, can replicate items between Jamf Pro servers. Unfortunately, replicating scripts doesn't change the contents of those scripts. So to make those scripts portable, what I would recommend first is not hard coding values into the script. Instead, leverage existing values on the computer. So if we need the Jamf Pro URL, we can read it from the preferences file that's inside of library preferences. This way, our script will always be looking at the Jamf Pro URL of the managed computer. If you have other values that you need to read frequently, you can deploy a custom settings plist file to a folder on the computer. Or you could create a plist file and upload that plist file into the application and custom settings configuration profile payload. This way, if you need to change those values, you can simply run a defaults write command if you've created the file or upload a new plist with new values to that payload. When you've uploaded it, the new payload will push out those values to all of your computers. For bonus points, beginning with Jamf Pro 10.19, you can even create a custom schema inside of the application and custom settings payload. This custom schema allows you to create or change values within your plist file without having to re-upload a new plist. This is really great for those of you who might be managing Jamf, or pardon me, managing Mac OS from something that's not Mac OS. See the technical paper entitled Managing Settings for Computer Applications Using JSON Schema and Jamf Pro on the Jamf.com Technical Resources page for more information. Next, let's talk a bit about errors. Remember that our goal is to use errors to our benefit when scripting. Take DSCL as an example. If we want to get group membership from one of our groups, we can use DSCL to read the group members, but some groups don't have members. If someone else were to run this script, they may see this error as a problem, possibly thinking that the script didn't work. 
In this case, we can silence our error by sending the standard error to dev null. However, occasionally we need error messages. What are some of those cases? Well, if we're missing a tool, or maybe something hasn't happened yet, well, we may need to return an error message. So in this example, uh, you're going to see a simplified extension attribute that returns a date if the full disk encryption recovery key was used to log in. How can we return error data when we're using a date formatted extension attribute? Simple. Let's pick some dates that couldn't possibly exist and use them. So we're going to return January 1st, 1980, if the recovery key has never been used. And we'll return January 1st, 1970, if FDE setup doesn't have the using recovery key verb. This allows us to use smart computer groups that key on those dates, like before January 2nd, 1970, or before January 2nd, 1980. A couple of, well, sorry, I totally forgot that a lot of you prefer dark mode. Is that better? Okay. So let's talk about scripting and speed. If we run sudo jamf policy at the command line, and then we enter our password, then we enter our password, you'll sometimes see this, which is an example of a blocked process. We can't actually run Jamf while Jamf is already running. So why does speed of execution matter? As you just saw, Jamf can be a blocking process. So if I'm in the middle of an inventory update, or if I'm running a policy and chaining another policy to it, I can have long execution times, and that can prevent another check-in for my computers. In extreme cases, we can have extreme lag, where we're dealing with the downloading of really, really large applications, and that would then cause our Jamf Pro to be unavailable, or not our Jamf Pro, but our Jamf process to be unavailable while that is downloading. In August, I actually had a case where a bad extension attribute prevented the inventory process from being submitted. As a matter of fact, what it actually did was it kept the Jamf process running so no other Jamf process could execute. As a result, the computer didn't check in for more than 24 hours when I finally figured out what the problem was. Thankfully, it was only happening in my test environment. Speed should always be a concern. So we know does the script work, but we also need to go back and take a look at is it running quickly? Is it running effectively and efficiently? A simple script with no loops and very few conditional statements executes in constant time. A great example of these scripts are extension attributes that read from an available plist file. Scripts that step through or loop over a series of data execute in linear time. The more records, the longer it takes for the scripts to execute. Some examples of these would be looping through available network interfaces or checking all of the Apple TV records in an uh, advanced search. Where caution is needed is when scripts execute loops inside of other loops. This can be an exponential time function. And as a result, you can lock up the Jamf Pro check-in process for an extended period of time. This can happen when you step through a series multiple times, like for instance, if I needed to compare the values that are inside of two groups with each other. It doesn't happen often, but it's worth mentioning that you've got to be careful about it. More often than not, I tend to see loops inside of loops when somebody includes a loop inside of a function. Like, for instance, they loop through a series of data and realize the data is backward. So they call a function that reverses the data. Well, if you call that from inside of the loop that's already processing the data, you now have a loop inside of a loop. All right, lastly, I wanna talk about comments for a hot second. Um, don't believe the myth of self-commenting code. 
if you can't look at the code tomorrow or the next day or the next week and recreate it, you should probably add a comment to that code. Especially if you work in an environment where there are multiple people administering Jamf Pro. Because just because you were able to create that piece of code doesn't mean that they know what it does. And they may be responsible for upkeeping it while you're out on vacation. Also, if you found the code on a specific website, that's great. Make a comment of where you found it. That way you might be able to go back and take a look at other tutorials that may exist on that website. It might help you streamline your code even further. So in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge a few people uh, for some information that they gave me on top of this presentation. First off to William Smith, whose campfire session from the most recent Mac Admins Conference, an introduction to WebEx, pardon me, an introduction to regular expressions, or regex. Regex is a very important part of awk, and if you can get better with regular expressions, you will get much better with awk as well. Personally, I am much better with the stream editor, or said, than I am with awk, and that's greatly due to said, an introduction and tutorial by Bruce Barnett, which is on the grimoire. Finally, I'd also like to give a shout out to Armin Briegel's site, Scripting OS X. Armin has a lot of great information there about how to script on Mac OS, including his new book, which is available on the iBook or the apps, pardon me, <laughs> the bookstore, which is entitled Moving to ZSH. Thank you very much for attending, and we greatly appreciate it.